set up. BC is here with us. I'm so excited for. So let me see if I can. Oh. All right. How about that? Can you hear me still? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Okay. So we're just gonna do. We're just gonna do Instagram today. Um. So, BC, can you, for anybody listening, because I know a couple of people who follow me may not be super um, familiar with you or your background, even though I did have you on the podcast, so shame on you guys if you don't know who BC is, <laughs> um, but can you just give us a little background of why you are, why I asked you to come on to talk about pet food, because you know all about it. Sure, sure, sure. let me... Uh... Do the quick intro. So I am BC Henshin. I formerly owned a store called Platinum Paws, which was a retail holistic pet food store. And we also had a high-end pet grooming. As I got into the industry, I actually started first with PetSmart as a dog trainer. And I started learning about nutrition working there and then I found a publication called Whole Dog Journal and that kind of took me down a different pathway. Can you can you shut your laptop and see if that helps? Is that what's going on? Maybe. Uh, yeah we can get rid of the laptop. Perfect. I mean I gotta prop my phone up against something else. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay. Does that sound a lot better? I was hearing something too. Yeah. That sounds okay, sorry. So to make this short as I started selling pet foods, I wanted to know how it was made, why it was made, because prior to my pet smart days, I actually was in construction and engineering and that type of thing. So that's kind of how my brain works. That got me involved with AFCO, which is the American Association of Feed Control Officials. They do not regulate our pet food as people assume they are an association of the people who regulate our feed. And that's confusing on its own. So I got involved with that, which got me involved with Susan Thixton, which is truth about pet food, uh, dot com. She's awesome. And my uh, ultimately digging into those places led me to sitting on the board for World Pet Association and some of these other associations. My goal in life is to help the micro independent pet stores survive in this world. And part of being a micro independent pet store is understanding the products that you're selling and helping pet parents make good informed decisions about their pet foods. Because unfortunately, a lot that's out there is just pure marketing. And uh, it really takes an independent minded holistic person to weed through that it does it really does and so i'm just gonna try to recap what i know that's like big headlines of what's going on in pet food right now and then we can maybe try to like break it down and get into the nitty-gritty at least some of the things that i was hoping we could touch on sure. first and foremost we've got a class action lawsuit which is really strange because there's currently only one named, um, is it defendant, I think? No, not defendant. It's the the other one. Plaintiff. I can never remember. Yes. Plaintiff. plaintiff, there you go. Um, there's only currently one named plaintiff, but they're leaving it open kind of for others. Um, and this lawsuit is against Hills Pet Food, as well as some named veterinarians and, um, uh, what is that foundation? Morris? Is it well, I have absolutely no idea what happened. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to get BC back on. There, BC. Okay, let's see if I can get you back in. What that was all about. Um, trying there we go. We got you. Oh, back my, on. that was fun. That was crazy I that has actually never happened so of course like since you're like I don't know what we're doing it had to happen. Right, yeah this is this is crazy you you've made it so easy for me <laughs> last I heard, I will, heard you were trying to remember tough tough yeah the, that's you know, dr. Lisa Freeman yeah 
is associated yeah. with is so, tough. So there is a lawsuit with Hills, a class action lawsuit against Hills, a number of named veterinarians, um, and they're claiming that there was some sort of like conspiracy um, to around the whole DCM debacle that they kind of created it, that they fabricated it, that they made it out to be something that it wasn't. Um, presumably because, and this is in the documents that were filed in uh, the court, that presumably because they had, Hills had lost market share specifically to Blue Buffalo, and they were very concerned with these like boutique um, uh, pet foods gaining market share. Um, uh, you know, who knows? That's what they're claiming in the lawsuit. Um, so that's one thing going on. And we know that, you know, Hills has had recalls in the past. Lots of bad things have happened to dogs in the past. Not good things. Um, and then separately, are you still with me, BC? I feel like you're, yeah. I think you might be frozen. But anyway, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so separately, we've got some unknown thing going on with Purina, where a lot of pet parents are complaining. They think there is a connection between their dogs getting sick, some of them, unfortunately, dying, and the pet food that they're feeding. The, the FDA has said that they are starting to investigate it because so many pet parents have started complaining about it. Um, we don't know where that's going. There's a lot of unknowns re, uh, surrounding that. Also, with Purina, there are lawyers out there who are trying to drum up, or they actually did file a class action, but I think they're trying to drum up more people to join the class action um, around the natural claims that Purina has on some of their products. Okay, do we get you back in here, BC? Instagram is so funny. Okay, we got you back. <laughs> I told you Instagram is finicky. <laughs> oh man, it is horrible. I, I, I feel bad. I hope everybody sticks with us through this. You're good. You're you're totally fine. And I think people understand because it's it is definitely an Instagram issue. Um so separate from the Hills issue, separate from the Hills class action lawsuit. We've got Purina, and Purina has, at this point, thousands of pet parents who are complaining that their dogs and cats are getting sick, some very significantly sick, some have passed away, and they believe there's a connection to pet food. We don't know what that connection is at this point. Um, I know Dr. Judy Morgan is doing her best to look into it. And the, the video that she put up last week, um, they're still trying to find labs to test. They believe it's pesticides, but just based on the symptoms, they believe it's pesticides. Um, but they're trying to prove that. And the reality is that FDA should actually be, pre I don't, that, that's a whole other thing. And then there's also a class action against Purina. And I think lawyers are actively trying to get um, pet parents involved in this class action um, filed in New York last year on the natural claims that they have on some of their foods. Um, so let's start with those. <laughs> I've got more, but let's start with those. Oh boy, we keep freezing up. So I'm I'm assuming you guys can hear me, but I think BC keeps freezing and we'll kind of wait for him to jump back in here. You go live with, except, hey, Rachel, I'm so glad you're here. Um, we're having some serious issues with Instagram today, but BC, you're back, so. Oh, it's horrible <laughs> and I'm gonna switch locations here. I, I don't know if it's on my end. You said Instagram's always like this, but They're man, it keeps pretty... kicking me me out yeah they're pretty finicky but it i don't know if it's if it's an internet connection or what we would i don't know 
But um, I think you know everything that's going on with Hills and Purina, and yep. we'll, we'll start there, because that's a lot to start with, because pet parents, um, understandably, are concerned and confused, and I guess the first the first thing people want to is like, is any of this true? How could any of this be going on? So let's uh, start with number one. If you have a pet that is showing anything not we're gonna try this again take three and see if, <laughs> if this works go live with okay we're gonna try this third time is a charm third time is a charm <laughs> oh lord I, I i mean i've changed everything so let's uh i i know I, I i messaged you i was like big pet food doesn't like us today <laughs> you know that's that can be more real than you think. I've been in some AFCO meetings that have gone interesting, and I'm not sure there wasn't a connection. But regardless, I hope I don't drop off again. Um, I, I'm sure you carried the ball, but w what I was saying when I disappeared, if you're seeing anything abnormal in your pets related to their feeding, that they, uh, they're trying – they're maybe not eating as fast as normal. Maybe they're eating too much, too little. They're pooping too much, too little. I would change foods. I mean, if it is not something that would immediately direct me to a veterinarian, if I'm just like, oh, well, my dog seems okay, but boy, he doesn't like eating anymore. That to me would be an indication to change brands. And I would go to a complete different side of the spectrum when I'm changing those brands. So you don't want to just stay in the Hills family or the Perina family. If you're feeding one of those, you need to get into something that's made in an entirely different place with entirely different ingredients. And that can be hard to figure out because you can have a pet food that's, a you know, great dog food that is actually made in the exact same place as a Hills or a um, one of the premium products because there's so many people that use co-packers, which are other manufacturing plants, and they also buy ingredients from the same location. So if you go into those smaller boutique, which, you know, we don't like to use the big terminology, which is boutique, exotic, and grain-free. If you go into one of those big foods, you have a higher chance of avoiding the same ingredients or vitamin mineral pack that the big uses. So, you know, that's the number one. Regardless of who's in a lawsuit and all of that, first and foremost is your pet. And the easiest thing to do is to change foods unless it is something that is, you know, life-threatening. But if you're just seeing something that, that's a little off with the feeding, change foods. And even if you are seeing something that requires veterinary help, change foods and deal with your veterinarian. But always keep the bag that you were feeding. Most importantly is the lock code because that can be helped to link all this through. So let's start with, I think that's the more scary conversation to have is we have Dr. Judy Morgan has basically become a clearinghouse of pet illnesses and fatalities. And she's trying to document and coordinate through and see, is there a trend here? And I think you're probably more up to speed to it, Jessica, than I am, but I don't think she's found any trend that she can point to at this point because yes there are some majority brands but the fact of the matter is it's all brands so from my experience in the industry we go back to you have i believe 70 million pets out there um and of course that number could be way off to high or low end but I think we've just now with the internet and Facebook groups and all that, we're starting to see a place where everybody can report what's going on. 
And it may not be a specific ingredient. It may be a whole formulation problem of a formulation that everybody's been using for years and years and years, but there's never been this type of widespread data to look at. Because you look at a feeding trial or you look at, you know, you're, you're going to do a sample of 100 dogs. I mean, what does that mean when you're talking about 70 million plus out there? So if you take somebody and their dog abruptly dies, you can't figure it out. It wasn't trauma. You, you're not, not sure what's going on. So you look at the food. Well, we got to encourage people to do necropsies, which are, you know, the, the dog autopsies. Um, we got to learn what's going on. I think this may turn out to be where it's a kind of avalanche of things. So the, the dog that passed away used this brand of vaccine and this brand of supplement and this brand of dog food. And if we set up that exact three and give it to another dog, it may not happen because the dog, you know, just like some people smoke till they're 98 years old and then other people smoke and get cancer. So we don't know. There's still a DNA factor to it, but Mm -hmm. then you take that three and you put it across 10 dogs and three of them die. Well, then you know you got something going on. So I think Dr. Judy is tracking a lot more than just what the dog ate. Uh, We got to remember the whole science behind dog food. So when we talk about these big companies talking about, you know, we've done all this money in research Nobody is researching that a piece of ground beef is good for your dog. They're researching, can we take that ground beef, cook the hecky darn out of it, cook it again, maybe even cook it a third time, put it in a mix, cook it some more, send it through an exterior, and have anything left that has any types of vitamins and minerals that that beef started with. Well, it doesn't, so we're gonna add in a bunch of stuff. That's the science. The science is how can we make a kibble nutritious to a dog because that is not the way that the dog is designed to eat. That's not what he should have. So the science is all about how do we make a food quickly, cost-effectively, and not kill dogs? Well, I don't think anybody so we go back to you know the 50s and the start of dog food nobody's had a sample base like this where you have you know the entire u.s reporting in what's happening so that's kind of that unknown is the more scary of the two now the keto foods lawsuit the 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 lawsuit that shows coordination absolutely that We've known from early on when really good vet nutritionists were looking at uh, Dr. Lisa Freeman's information and saying, now, wait a minute, there's there's holes in this science. They're, they're, they're making correlations that are not really backed up by the evidence, and a lot of stuff is lopsided. So that's where that lawsuit has come to be. And I'm proud of him. There's not a lot of people who go up against big pet food. Big pet food is a very powerful, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And if you look at all the industries in the U.S., makeup and, uh, you know, everything you look at, pet food is usually on the rise, always, you know, People want to say it's recession proof because people love their pets. People are getting more pets every day and they're trying to treat their pets better every single day. So it's hard to lose your money on pet food and you're talking about billions. So that study about DCM, Hills, which was way behind 
the science and the education and the knowledge about grain free, Hill said, you know what, this may actually help us if we get people against grain free food. And I don't think it was actually Hills that said that. I believe these researchers thought, you know, we can get a lot more funding if we kind of kind of show this data because then it Hills is going to open up the checkbook. So, you know, that lawsuit, I don't know where it's going to go. The amazing thing is as a store owner, I would jump onto that because I can show a dis- Distinct decline in the purchase of grain free dog food based on it wasn't Dr. Lisa Freeman. She, of course, started the study, but it was when the World Veterinary Association started uh, putting out, out that information, which was very one sided to all of its veterinary partners and saying, This is what you need to tell your clients. Well, people walked in and said, My vet told me not to feed a grain-free food anymore. Well, as a store owner, how, how do you counter that? And said, well, you know, I've been in a lot of pet nutrition. I have some certifications. I have that. The answer is always, you're not a veterinarian. I'm going to follow my veterinarian. Well, unfortunately, a lot of veterinarians got their information wrong. And a lot of veterinarians don't spend their time in the nutrition world like a micro-independent store owner does. Right. So, I mean, even to this day, veterinarians are telling their clients not to buy grain-free food. Like today, there are veterinarians actively telling <laughs> their clients stay away from grain-free food. So it's even even with this lawsuit, which is big news, this bad information, probably bad information is is um, persisting. Um, that's how good of a job they they did. <laughs> Whatever you know the motive was behind it. Um, that's how good of a job they did. But so you brought up a really interesting point specifically about this all the issues with Purina probably yep. and then all, all of the other brands that are also being implicated. Purina is the biggest one, which is kind of why we all just say Purina, Purina. But a lot of other brands are also being implicated. And you brought up a really good point. And I'm wondering, and this is just complete speculation on my part for, you know, anybody listening, but I'm wondering if if you, if I understood it correctly. So could it, be, you know, we don't know what is actually actually going on right now. Dr. Judy Morgan, as you said, she is she has sent out so many samples for testing, but it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. You have to ask for a specific tests to be run. And if you don't know what it is you're looking for, you're just kind of like throwing darts, right? Trying to hit something. Um, and is it possible that maybe nothing specific is being done differently that hasn't been done so many times in the past, but our dogs are just getting sicker and sicker and sicker every generation because they've been fed so poorly generation after generation that they're just not able to handle it as well. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. I mean, you you certainly look at why are dogs more allergic nowadays and why well, we see a lot of chicken allergies. I mean, if we do see a food allergy, which again is not all that common, but if we see one, it's probably gonna be in chicken and it's because chicken's been overfed so much. It's been used since the addition of dog food. So um, yes, I mean, I think you're on the right path. I think we're all kind of thinking the same thing that to back up, let's say we wanted to start over and say, okay, all the guidelines, all the AFCO uh, correlation of the guidelines. Well, I thought the third time was the charm. We're going to try for four. Um, This has been the craziest live stream, the craziest live stream ever. (laughs) It's killing me here. Oh my goodness gracious. 
I don't know if you're able, are you staying through all this or no. when it goes, are they losing you too? Yeah, it's kicking me out too. So I don't know what, in the, like I, I literally have never had a live stream go like this before. <laughs> well, for those that are staying with us, thank you for keeping with us. And yeah, I don't, this is all very interesting, but um, I know we were talking about making that correlation when when I was thrown out very rudely I might mention uh, the if we just wanted to start over if we wanted to take the book of regulations and say you know let's look at this now based on where pets are now the problem is to really come up with that accurate um, research data pets have to lose their lives. I mean, that is how that works. So Dr. Jean Dodds, we all love her. She did the vaccine challenges, but to do that where the government would accept it, that study, you had to have X amount of dogs that were given the vaccination and you had to have a control that wasn't, and then you had to expose them to rabies. So one dog was going to die. Mm -hmm. And so if we say, okay, we don't think we got fats right. Let's look at how we do fats in pet food. Well, the researchers are going to set up tests that are going to have upper end limits and lower end limits. And how do they really figure that? It's not by numbers anymore. I mean, it's still animals are going to lose their lives. And that's why nobody wants to do the big major research. But the fact of the matter is the book that we're going by, number one, was completely orchestrated, engineered for cooked kibble that was processed a certain way. Mm -hmm. Well, now here we are. We have a whole lot of different ways to process dog food. I mean, you have freeze dried, you have air baked, you have the kibble extruded. Um, you, you have, of course, your raw, you have pasteurized, non-pasteurized. I mean, there's a whole lot of different formats that food come in, comes in for our pets nowadays that that book doesn't know. One of the best formulators in the world for raw pet food um, is Roxana Stone. She's, she's awesome. And there are things that if she followed that book, her food would harm dogs because you can't treat things in raw food the same way that you treat it in a highly baked extruded kibble. I'm so glad you said that. Um, that is absolutely, I mean, it's, it's a passion of mine to talk about that. And I've had multiple people on to say just that because the truth is that all of the all of the regulation that the states adopt based on AFCO's recommendations are, are are put there are created for big companies. It and it it's very much um, my understanding because I haven't been to an AFCO meeting myself, but my understanding is that it is very much to dispose of human waste and that's what the industry is kind of founded and based upon so um the regulation isn't there for the health of our pets is kind of the bottom line for how i understand it correct so you know i encourage everybody in the industry not necessarily pet owners um just because it would cost i mean it's 500 dollars to to visit avco and avco is a private organization so they can kick anybody out for any reason whatsoever i mean it's completely a private event um but when you go there if there's going to be a new ingredient to pet food that is brought to the association by the person that is wanting to sell that ingredient or use that ingredient so it is, let's say BC's Pet Food Company wants to use, you know, a type of mushroom that hasn't been used before. 
So I'll, I personally, as the pet food company, would do the research to show that this mushroom is not harmful when it's put in my food. And then I would present that to the board and the board has to get certain sign offs. They would have people that would say, okay, have you done this, this, and this? And literally it goes through a group that checks it off. So FDA will look at it and go, yeah, it looks fine to us. And then the next group will look at it, which is the Center for Veterinary Medicine. Well, okay, no problems here. And that's how that ingredient gets approved. So what's happened throughout that evolution is you have people that are, you know, dealing with slaughtered cows and they're looking at their floor and they're going, you know what? These remnants could be used for something. Well, why don't we put together a package and make it for feed? So they will put together a package to present, which then gets them listed. Okay, we can use these as ingredients in pet food. So the only thing they're looking at is kind of just like what I, I said about the book. They're looking at, okay, it doesn't kill anybody. Let's use it. You know, nobody's really saying, is this beneficial for the pet? Is this the best way that we can do this? Is the pet going to process it the way that we think? Is is the vet really going to get any omegas out of this once it's been processed that way? That's not what they look at. They literally are saying, okay, we're pretty sure this is not going to kill anybody. And that's how that approval works. And it, it's it's a lot different world than what people believe AFCO is. So that's kind of my soapbox on AFCO. Anybody in the industry should go at least once just to see the madness. And and then you'll you'll walk out of there with a new understanding of this organization and more importantly of how that food is being formulated. Yeah, I'm considering it's it's in San Antonio um, later this Sure. So I'm considering because it's so close <laughs> to me. <laughs> I'm considering because it does seem like, you know, something you have to experience to really understand it. Um, but I think this might be one of the most important questions that I can ask you that pet parents need to hear the answer to. One of the biggest, like, more than anything, what I'm seeing people say in defense, which drives me bonkers, to be in defense of a huge conglomerate that doesn't know or care about you, but whatever, that it is what it is. Um, it's hard for us to like, to, to take a look at our egos and combat a belief system that we have. I get that. Um, but so many at this point thousands of pet parents are saying that their pets are sick or worse and they believe that it could be related to the pet food purina being at the top of that list right now and one of the biggest pushbacks i'm hearing is that well there's no recall can you t talk to that a little bit about you know how long this takes and why why we're not seeing a recall yet and why that shouldn't be in my opinion it shouldn't be the basis for do you switch foods or not like we can we can make this decision so much earlier yes uh so let's start off number one most recalls are voluntary most recalls are not forced by the fda even though they are encouraged by the fda but the pushback on recalls so we're going we're going to get into the weeds here, but the pushback on recalls comes from the insurance companies. The manufacturers are insured against recalls. Um, now, some of the big boys do their own insurance, but when, when you're talking the majority of manufacturers, if they have a recall, there is insurance that covers them for that loss. So, a lot of times the insurance companies will get involved and say, no, there's no basis for this recall. There's no, there's no reason that we're going to recall over one issue. 
So you take something that happened to one of our friends in the industry, um, one of the raw friends, he had a recall. He initiated that recall. He said, I'm going to recall that lot. Um, so, you know, it goes back to number one, you have to have a good reason for a recall in my opinion and the insurance. So I, I'm also one that sits here right now and says, I don't think there is a need for a recall because we don't, it's two across the board. If these, doctors that are looking at this and FDA is looking at this as well they're silent on the issue and they have to be even more careful because of the keto lawsuit because you know you start making a lot of statements that are not really founded by the evidence you're in trouble which is what happened during the DCM issue a lot of stuff was happening, including statements made by the FDA that are now completely false. And so people are even more guarded than what they need to be. But for there to be a recall, you, you really need to say, this is what is wrong with this batch. And this is why I'm recalling it. And this is what we need to do now. With that being said, like I said, personally, I don't think there's enough data to justify any one recall right now. If I was feeding Prina Pro Plan, I absolutely would switch foods. But that doesn't mean that I wouldn't go back. I don't care if I'm wearing the Prina Pro Plan hat and shirt that were given to me because I'm a breeder of theirs and they give me free swag all the time. I still would switch to another manufacturer. I would run maybe six months or a year. And if nothing was going on, then I would go back to my beloved first choice pet food. So that doesn't matter if it was Prina or it was, you know, old Roy. Right now, if I was feeding anything that was mainstreamed, I would switch to something smaller just to be on the safe side. And again, I mean, we have to understand that people are very loyal to their brands, but that four-legged pet that you are responsible for should be your first choice. And if the exact same thing was happening with Kraft macaroni and cheese, you probably would say, you know, I'm just not sure what's going on here. So I'm going to try a different brand of Kraft macaroni and cheese for the time being. Um, so that that is always kind of what I would do. Again, if you love Pro Plan, great. I'm glad you do. But but there is definitely some stuff going on. Um, so nobody's sure what. And let's face it, when we talk about 2007 and the big recall of melamine. Nobody was looking for that in pet food at the time. Pets were dying. Everybody knew they were dying. And they didn't know why they were dying until somebody finally said, wait, there's something strange here, and figured out that it was something put into the pet food that wasn't ever supposed to be there. So, you know, if somebody mixes gunpowder with pet food, are they looking for gunpowder in pet food? They aren't. That's that's not something that's on the standardary standard tests. But then they learn something, they get more information. Well, then they start looking for, you know, dynamite in pet food. Oh yeah, here it is. We should have been looking for that. So we we have to understand again, like I, I said, you know, in one of the many times that I was cut off, <laughs> seventy million pets. So there's a lot of pets that are being fed right now that aren't having a problem. And even if we say, okay, there's 7 million dogs that are having a problem, that's still relatively small when we're talking about how much pet food is made, how many pets are out there, all of that. So it's going to take a while to figure it out. And it may just be where they say, you know what, this micro ingredient needs to be increased 
or decreased. You know, it might be something as simple as taurine. You know, there's no mandate for taurine to be in dog food. There is a mandate for it to be in cat food. Now, most manufacturers put it in dog food. That's kind of related back in the DCM book. But so that may be one of those things where AFCO, through its feed control officials, say, you know what? We now believe there should be X amount parts per million of taurine in dog food. And they change that regulation. And all of a sudden, there there's not as many. But again, what we're seeing on the Saving Pets, One Pet at a Time Facebook group, whatever that is, you know, we're just seeing the bad. I mean, keep in mind, there's still a lot of pets out there that are doing okay. Could they do better on a better food? Absolutely. But that's, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah, it is. So I think what I understood from that is that on the pet food side of it, it's a numbers game. Um, as, as far as, you know, how many pets are sick, how many pets are fine, like, what is it going to cost one way or the other? That's kind of where they have to look. Um, and because of that, pet parents need to be aware of that and take their own pet's health into consideration first and foremost and be safe rather than sorry. Right. So... On top of that, has anybody really heard about this lawsuit that's not a pet food junkie like we are? Right. You know, the news hasn't really talked about this lawsuit, but every single news story did something on DCM. Mm -hmm. So when DCM occurred, I, I jumped on the phone. I've been on our local media all the time talking about pets, talking about fun things. I jumped on the phone to a producer and said, I need to come on and talk about this DCM. And he was like, yeah, man, you got to come on and talk about it. It's a mess. And I said, yeah, it's not really as bad as you think. And they're going the wrong direction. And he said, yeah, you won't be coming on to say that. Right. So he, he gets, he being his network, gets a lot of advertising from Big Pet Food. Mm -hmm. They aren't necessarily told big pet food doesn't say by golly you better not run that store or i won't advertise with you they never say that but those directors and those those advertising people say you know what we don't want to risk making them mad right so that's the first thing that i feel like i say that's the first thing a lot of times but pet parents need to be tied in via you be via Rachel, uh, by um, Dr. Judy Morgan, uh, truthaboutpetfood.com. Pet parents need to be following sources outside of the media. The media is never going to say, you know what, there's a problem with ProPlan, unless it is absolutely, without a doubt, no questions, and ProPlan has already put out their marketing answers you know mm -hmm. they they never will on any of the big pet food there's too much money in big pet food so have, have pet parents look at other resources and even if you don't a lot of people say well truth about pet food that's definitely one-sided blah 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 i mean we have to argue about everything so follow her and follow somebody else i mean you you need to Take in this information yourself and make your decisions mm -hmm. based on what you believe uh, personally. So I would never be waiting on a recall to switch. If I heard enough people, which there are a lot of people saying a lot of things about a lot of different brands, I would go and switch that brand. And you know what? Maybe this is the time to jump out and try your hand at cooking some of your own food. I will tell you, Jessica, and you've, you've probably heard this yourself, but there are people saying that all of this is just the same of what they did about DCM, except it's being done by holistic veterinarians and small uh, feed manufacturers. Well, that's absolutely not the case, but hey, that's 
that's fine. At least you're seeing both sides. Yeah. You decide which side you want to go on to. Yeah. I don't, I, I have absolutely heard that. Um, I agree with you. I don't think that is the case, but hey, you know what? If be, if you want to be skeptical, be skeptical of both sides. Um, um, and, and, you know, like you said, take in information on both sides. And I think the reality is like, you know, feed the best food that you can afford, the smallest company you can afford to feed, like you've said before. Um, and I'm also wondering if you have a few more minutes, hopefully, if Instagram doesn't kick us off again. <laughs> We've been on a long roll. I'm kind of nervous. I am too. <laughs> um, I, it was, it's just been heavy on my heart that the difference is in how the FDA treats big pet food and smaller pet food manufacturers. Um, a, a, a raw company recently had a recall and um, I'm not saying that that was even wrong. I, 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 I don't necessarily disagree that, that, that it shouldn't have happened. I think it probably should have happened. Um, but there are stark differences in how regular, reg, you know, the regulatory body treats big pet food and these smaller pet food manufacturers. Do you have any comment on that? Well, once again, I would, um, go back to AFCO. So Big Pet Food, through its association, has multiple seats at the table. So the table is literally, there is a table in the middle of the room, and only certain people can sit at that table. And that is the people that are going to be making the votes. Um, you know, everybody in the room is associated some way or another. But Big pet food has a lot of say at that table. And again, if you look at the big, big three manufacturers that make up 90% of the pet food made, I mean, I forget the exact um, percentages, but it, it's up there. You understand that they have the most dollars going on about this. And when you talk about Okay, the, the association is feed control officials. So the I got, got to do this carefully. The feed control official for the state that one of these big manufacturers were in. So big manufacturer has offices in there. They have warehouses in there. They have manufacturing plants in there. They have ingredient suppliers in there. I mean, they have everything in, in that state. And there may be two or three feed control officials for that state. And they get a report that this is bad. Something is happening. So they go to that manufacturer and they say, here's the report. Can you help us understand it? Let's go through this. And if that big manufacturer says, you know, this is nothing. You shouldn't believe it. Don't waste your time on this those feed control officials are going to kind of listen to that manufacturer because they bring a lot of tax dollars to that state. They are bringing in a lot of public school financing and streets and all these things that if this manufacturer gets mad at us and says, you know what, I'm going over to the next state. Their feed control officials aren't hounding me about minor stuff. Well, that's the last thing they want because those feed control officials will have to find a new job because somebody in the state will say you cost us this manufacturing plan mm -hmm. so you have to remember that's kind of behind the scenes as well and then you also have to remember there's a lot of crazies out there i mean you there are you've probably seen it you know there are a lot of really weird people that want to fire off emails to the FDA and to different people about different things. And so the FDA kind of says, we don't want to waste our time talking to one person. You know, we want to talk to, if you have an issue, so 
you know, again, Susan Thixton has brought things to the FDA, but they didn't necessarily listen to her, even though she had an association. So she got a couple veterinarians to go with her. So she had an association go with her. She had herself and she had Dr. Karen Becker go with her to talk about an issue with the FDA. And they sat down with her. But if just Susan would have said, I want to sit down with the FDA, that's a harder thing. Now, Susan can get it done, trust me, because she doesn't back off of anything. But, you know, again, if I call up the FDA and I know who to ask for, I'm not going to get past their secretary. But if Hill calls up the FDA, he's going to pick up the phone because, again, there's a lot of money involved. And I don't want to be that conspiracy theorist that says it's all about the almighty dollar because it isn't. And I also don't want to say that Hills or Purina is doing things to harm our pets with the knowledge that they are doing it. Mm -hmm. Their knowledge is a different world. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know that, well, again, I, I mentioned it earlier. You can buy a pack of Lucky Strikes right now at the gas station, and I don't think there's anybody that questions that smoking isn't good for anybody. But if you talk to the manufacturer of Lucky Strike, he's got a different spin on that. He doesn't necessarily agree with your viewpoints and he's got doctors on his staff too so we have to just understand that we have a lot of difference in opinions on the differences that we want to do our dogs a lot of these big companies are relying on old science and you know you got to give a hat tip to them because you know prina 50 years ago 40 years ago there wasn't any of this stuff we were talking about and they were breaking science and they were figuring out how to make a safe kibble for pets. The problem is that same data, we've learned so much more and we can do so much better, but that's not what they grew up on. That's not what they know. That's not what their people know. And if you want to walk into the Purina or any of the big pet and say, you know what? By golly, I got a new way to do things. You guys have been doing it wrong for all these years. They're going to say, hit the door. That's not what they do. So you got to look at companies that are out there that are doing things differently. And usually it starts with the small manufacturers. And the exact same thing happened with grain free. You know, when you looked out there, there were, in the beginning, there was one grain free manufacturer. That's it. Then there were two, and then there were 10. Well, then the studies started being released. Studies that these manufacturers had already done, but they didn't put them out because they would get attacked and they would find themselves getting blacklisted by the big manufacturers. So now all the same people, uh, Prina Pro Plan has a grain free. About everybody has a grain free, I think, except for Hills and they may even have a grain free now. Um, so again, you got to kind of understand where you are in the cycle. Right now, we may be this problem that everybody's looking into with the death of pets. We may be on another breakthrough where we're going to learn this is where the problem is. You know, uh, you touched on this a little earlier when we talk about, could this just be kind of ancestral? That, you know, this is what has evolved over time, that there's been a problem with the pet food, but our pets have kind of evolved to show the issue. The a scientist that I was talking with recently said, the corn now is not the corn that it was formulated with mm -hmm. even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, so <laughs> is there now a problem with corn that a lot of dogs are having an issue with and that's leading to the deaths? We don't know. We might find out that is the case, that our, our modern-day mass-produced corn is not good for our pet food formulations. Mm. 
That's very interesting. And, and I mean, <laughs> obviously it's all, you know, speculation right now, regardless Absolutely. of what I say or what I say or what anybody says. Um, like I said earlier, Dr. Judy Morgan's video last week said that their, their current theory is pesticides, but still we don't know. Um, and could that actually be from the corn or from the grain? Because maybe, you know, who, we don't know at this point. So, um, yeah, I think, like you said, it kind of all to wrap it all up is just you have we just we don't live in a world anymore where you can just blindly buy something off the shelf and think it's good. Like we have to start educating ourselves more and becoming more involved with what we're bringing into our homes and feeding our children and our pets. Um, so yeah, I think that's where we are. Was there anything else that um, maybe we didn't touch on that you wanted to make sure you said about this? Sure, I, I wanna go back because we were so choppy in the beginning. Yeah. Um, the most important thing for pets, parents, if you are seeing anything at all strange about your dog switch foods i mean i don't care oh, i fed this dog food for 10 years and you know he didn't want to eat tonight well that that means something in our pets so the easiest thing to do if you don't think it's a life-threatening veterinary problem switch the dog food you know again big companies and even small manufacturers are guilty of this will tell you not to switch your pet foods, and that is complete marketing. There's not one single, again, except for some old school veterinarians, most will tell you it's okay to switch, and your dogs are actually, that's what they're used to. They might get a rabbit in the woods today, and tomorrow they might get a chicken. You know, their systems do not blow up because of change. They blow up because we force them to just have one food for a year and then we change it on them. So, you know, change your food often is what I would do, but if you're scared to do that, just make a change for six months, a year, let us figure out what's going on with pet food. And then if you wanna come back to your almighty brand, that's great. And uh, the only other thing that I always try and tell people is, um, you know, everything matters. So what you're feeding your dog it goes from treats to the kibble to the vaccinations. Everything that you're putting into your dog, you should be scrutinizing like you would. Actually, I always say my pets eat better than I do. I might have some junk food tomorrow, but I might have a salad tomorrow as well. We put our dog food onto a diet and we never ever change it. And that's horrible. So, you know, again, rotation look into adding an element of fresh foods. It, it can give you some safety as well. But yeah, one of your commenters says, listen to our pets. Uh, That's the key. That is absolutely the key. And uh, you guys, it, it's crazy. Keep listening to people like Jessica because she's incredible. Keep watching um, Susan Thixton. She's incredible. Most of these people are incredible. Feed small. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for that, Kimberly. I also encourage people to follow Kimberly at, she's at Raw Feeder Life on Instagram. Um, her blog is Keep the Tail Wagging, and um, she's just such a huge resource. She has always been such a huge resource for me. Um, I think I told her that, like, I actually found her before I even found Dr. Becker, which was crazy. <laughs> I have seen her give a piece of bread to a dog that never ever had bread and it's one of the funniest things in my life and it's still talked about today it but is. yes kimberly is incredible we love her it is still talked about today in fact i think yes. i saw something on it earlier this year they were they were posting about it um on instagram so <laughs> funny funny stuff um BC, thank you so much um, for helping break this down because there are so many different viewpoints. And I know even like me, like I try to be open to different positions 
and look at things from different angles, but sometimes I just don't know the different angles to look at. And I think the same is true for a lot of other people, a lot of pet parents. So having a different viewpoint like you have um, to help us kind of see a bigger picture is so valuable and important. And I just want to say thank you again. Anytime, anytime you need me, you know, I'm here for you. Thank you. And of course, thank you for um, keep, keeping coming back because we were, we were we're on take four right now <laughs> uh, technology <laughs> yes um and i do hope to see you if you if you go to super zoo let me know i hope to see you there and yeah and and cat as well and um guys if you don't follow bc please make sure to follow him and follow um the ninja groomer because ninja uh, groomer the new build um from him and him and his wife cat um and if you haven't by the way listened to cat's interview on the pet parenting reset it's it's getting like older now but i'm telling you she informed me of so many things um about grooming with dogs i had so many like preconceived notions and i was just not a fan of groomers until i talked to cat so <laughs> please go back and listen to that episode as well. Thank you again, BC. And I, yeah, look forward to bringing you back soon and seeing you at Super Zoom. We'll see what happens with all this. Take care now. <laughs> Bye.